गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन एम ऑडिबल ओके आर एबल टू सी ए स्क्रीन ओके प्लीज स्विच ऑन यूर वेब कैम्स ऑल ऑफ यू I would want the class to be more interactive, so please switch on your webcam so that I can see you all. Okay, welcome to the analysis of the Union Budget 22-23. Before starting with the analysis of this year's budget, let me highlight the significance of the budget from the perspective of prelims as well as the mains examination. See, as far as the prelims examination is concerned, we have seen that repeatedly questions are asked directly from the budget and the economic survey in the prelims examination. Now, for example, if you have seen the previous year prelims questions, questions are normally asked with respect to trends in various macroeconomic indicators, such as the trends in GDP growth rates, tax to GDP ratio, trends in fiscal deficit, and so on. So these are the questions which are directly asked from budget and the economic survey. Similarly, in the mains examination, once again, questions are asked directly from the economic survey and budget. For example, this year we had a question. as to whether indian economy is showing a v shaped economic recovery which was one of the most dominant theme in the last year's economic survey so both budget as well as economic survey play a very very important role as far as your prelims and the mains examination is concerned so here we are going to decode or we are going to simplify the union budget 22 23 so before starting with this year's budget let me first discuss as to how we are going to simplify the budget 22 23 as to what would be our approach so first and foremost we will understand the basics of the budget that is from the perspective of the constitutional provisions related to the budget next we will understand the background to the budget that is what are the problems what are the challenges which the indian economy is presently facing and how the finance minister has decided to address these concerns and challenges next i hope all of you must be knowing that we are celebrating 75 years of uh, india's independence so it is called as amrit mahotsav and in the next 25 years india is set to transition from india at 75 to india at 100 so this transition period of 25 years from india at 75 to india at 100 the finance minister has called this transition period as amrit kal accordingly this year's budget it is considered to be visionary it is considered to be a futuristic budget because it has laid down a blueprint for amrit kal as to how we can steer the indian economy from india at 75 to india at 100 so we'll understand as to what is this blueprint for amrit kal next see i keep on saying that you know budget when it is presented it is presented from the perspective of indian economy it is not uh, presented from the perspective of the students who are preparing for the upsc examination so here what we are going to do is we are going to break down this budget into your uh, upsc centric knowledge how see while presenting the budget the finance minister highlighted that there will be four major priority areas of the government some of these priority areas include the pradhan mantri gati shakti master plan inclusive growth and development emphasis on sunrise sectors financing and so on so now when the finance minister presented the budget under each of these priority areas the finance minister has announced various initiatives but when we are approaching the budget we are not going to discuss the budget in a sequential order as presented by the finance minister instead what we will do is what all initiatives have been launched all of these initiatives will put them under your broad syllabus headings for example all the initiatives related to infrastructure will put them under the pillar of infrastructure all the initiatives related to banking and finance under the pillar of banking and finance so whatever initiatives have been launched in the budget we will put them under your broad parameters of syllabus and then we will adopt a thematic approach in this thematic approach what we will do is 
let's say i take up the theme of infrastructure sector in this infrastructure sector you will come across some major themes or major announcements and some minor announcements as far as these major announcements are concerned these major announcements we will analyze by adopting a 360 by adopting a 360 degree approach so all of these major initiatives we will analyze through a 360 degree approach so we'll discuss everything related to those aspects plus plus we will also include the prelim space mcqs and mains question for practice now for example you must be knowing that uh, in this year's budget the finance minister has announced that uh, the government will soon come up with a battery swapping policy so when we are analyzing the budget we will understand as to what do you mean by battery swapping policy what are the benefits of battery swapping policy what are the challenges with respect to battery swapping policy everything related to the battery swapping policy similarly this year's budget the finance minister has announced that the rbi will come out with the central bank digital currency so we'll understand what why and how of central bank digital currency so that if at all there is a question in the mains examination with respect to central bank digital currency be it with respect to benefits or with respect to challenges you should be in a position to write an answer to such a question as far as the minor initiatives are concerned we will just discuss as to what are these minor initiatives which have been launched in this year's budget now these minor initiatives as such we can get direct question in the prelims examination for example you know that this year's budget the finance minister has announced vibrant villages scheme so we can get a direct question in the prelims as to what does the vibrant villages scheme deals with apart from that if you know about the vibrant villages scheme you can use this particular scheme as a fodder point while writing an answer in gs paper 3 particularly with respect to border management so with respect to vibrant villages scheme as i was saying you could incorporate this as a fodder point directly in gs paper 3 that is under the syllabus of border management or you could use it in gs paper through paper 2 that is with respect to indo china border dispute so that is how you can use various initiatives in the budget both in prelims as well as the mains examination so this is how we are going to simplify the union budget 22 23 so let's start our discussion with respect to basics of the union budget so we'll understand various constitutional provisions related to the union budget so as far as notes for this particular session is concerned you don't have to focus on making notes sit back relax for the next 2 to 2 and a half hours focus on understanding what i'm going to teach you uh, as far as the notes are concerned whatever i'm discussing everything everything is there in the slide and this slide will be shared with you at the end of the class so just sit back relax and understand the concepts so with respect to basics of the budget so i hope uh, all of you must be knowing about article 112 of the indian constitution article 112 of the indian constitution requires the government to present the annual financial statement before the parliament every financial year the annual financial statement provides us with the details of the receipts and expenditure of the government of india and whenever we say annual financial statement please understand here that in the annual financial statement the government does not give the details of receipts and expenditure for a single financial year rather the government gives the details of receipts and expenditure for three financial years for example as you can see for the previous financial year the government gives us the details of actual receipts and expenditure that is how much money the government has actually received and spent this is for the previous financial year for the present financial year the government gives us a details of revised estimates of receipts and expenditure now why do we call it as estimates once again see budget as you know it is presented on 1st of february but when does the financial year end financial year end ends on march 31st so can i say there are another two months left for the present financial year to end right so that is why for the present financial year the government gives us only the 
estimates and not the actual receipts and expenditure and as far as the next financial year is concerned for the next financial year the government gives us the details of once again estimates of receipts and expenditure now you must be wondering that when you are preparing for the prelims examination on which receipts and expenditure should you focus upon for example if you get a question with respect to tax to gdp ratio share of different taxes share of direct and indirect taxes which receipts should you focus upon among these three receipts and expenditure your focus should be on the present financial year not on the past or the next financial year so if you know about these things that alone is more than sufficient clear next whenever the annual financial statement is presented the annual financial statement is required to be presented under three broad heads that is consolidated fund of india contingency fund of india and the public account of india as far as consolidated fund of india is concerned it derives its existence from article 266 of the indian constitution what does the consolidated fund of india include consolidated fund of india includes whatever money the government raises in the form of taxes plus whatever money the government borrows plus whatever loans the central government recovers from the state government so normally the central government gives loans to the state government so when it recovers that loan even that loan will be part of the consolidated fund of india as far as whether the government can withdraw money from the consolidated fund of india without the parliamentary approval no the government is compulsorily required to take the prior approval from the parliament in order to withdraw money from the consolidated fund of india so whenever the finance minister presents a budget the finance minister presents two bills one is finance bill and the other one is the appropriation bill the finance bill basically includes the changes to the tax policies changes to the tax rates so that is the finance bill the appropriation bill deals with the expenditure side of the budget so under the appropriation bill the finance minister or the government takes the permission or the approval of the parliament to withdraw money from the consolidated fund of india so finance bill deals with the income side appropriation bill deals with the expenditure side now coming to contingency fund of india the contingency fund of india it is placed at the disposal of the president to meet certain emergency or exigencies the corpus of the public account of india right now is rupees 30000 crores please make a note of this because earlier that is before the last financial year the corpus of public account of india used to be 500 crores and in the last financial year the corpus got increased from 500 crores to 30000 crores so if you are reading some of the older books in the older books the figure has been mentioned as 200 crores so it is not 200 crores rather it is 30000 crores as of now apart from that the government can very well spend the money from the contingency fund of india without the prior approval of the parliament prior approval is not needed but once the money is already spent the government is required to give details to the parliament that so and so amount of money was spent from the contingency fund of india and then the parliament will approve it so it is not prior approval it is ex post facto approval which is needed for contingency fund of india please remember this next coming to public account of india which once again derives its existence from article 266 so under the public account of india we basically have two types of monies one is the money held by the government in trust that is basically public money which is lying with the government i hope you must be knowing that the government implements a large number of small saving schemes such as the post office deposits the kisan vikas patra sukanya samriddhi account so all of these are small saving schemes apart from that the government also collects the provident fund deposits from the people 
So all that money of the public, which lies with the government is part of the public account of India. Apart from that, now this is very important from the perspective of prelims, please focus here. I hope you must be knowing that the government uh, imposes a number of cess. For example, you have road and infrastructure cess, health and education cess, and so on. Now, whenever the government collects a cess, all of this cess initially, initially it gets credited to the consolidated fund of India. Initially, it goes to consolidated fund of India. Later on, with the approval of the parliament, this money then from the consolidated fund of India comes into public account of India. And under public account of India, it is maintained under separate accounts, separate funds. For example, we are imposing road and infrastructure cess. This cess initially gets credited to the consolidated fund of India. From consolidated fund of India, with the approval of parliament, it comes to public account of India and it becomes part of central road and infrastructure fund. Similarly, the health cess becomes part of Pradhan Mantri Swastha Suraksha Nidhi. The education cess becomes part of Prarambik Shiksha Kosh and uh, Madhyamik and Uchchatar Shiksha Kosh. So as you know, these funds are used for a specific purposes. Apart from that, very important aspect that NDRF, National Disaster Response Fund, NDRF is not part of Consolidated Fund of India. Rather, it is part of public account of India. Please make a note of this. Now, most of the students actually think that government approval is not at all needed to withdraw money from the public account of India. Now, this, this is actually not completely true because if the government want to withdraw this money, which the government is holding in the trust of the public, for this money, Parliamentary approval is not needed. If the government wants to withdraw this money, parliamentary approval is not needed. But, but if the government wants to withdraw money from these funds, CRIF, Pradhan Mantri, Sox, Suraksha Nidhi and so on, compulsory prior approval of the parliament is needed. So if you come across a statement in the prelims examination that no parliamentary approval is at all needed, to withdraw money from the public account of India, this statement would be wrong. I hope you are getting this. Okay. Because for some parts, prior parliament, parliamentary approval is very well needed. I hope you are clear now, all of you. Yes. Okay. Now this is the most important part. See, in case if you have any doubts during the course of the session, please hold on to your doubts. I will come back to your doubts at the end of the session. I will ensure that all of your doubts, each one of your doubts are re resolved at the end of the session. Sit back, relax, and whatever notes which are required to made, everything I've incorporated in the PPT itself. As you can see the PPT, the PPT itself, I've made it as comprehensive as possible so that it becomes quite easier for you later on. So now we are going to discuss the background to the budget. As part of this background, we are going to understand as to what are the problems which the Indian economy is facing right now and how these problems are sought to be addressed by the finance minister in this year's budget. See, as far as Indian economy is concerned, the Indian economy was facing slowdown even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, the Indian economy started facing slowdown from the year 2016-17 itself. Why? Because I hope you must be knowing that the banks in case of India had accumulated more amount of non-performing assets. The balance sheets of the banks had got adversely affected. Banks were facing the twin balance sheet problem. So banks in a way, they were not in a position to give loans. So there was a decline in the investment rates in the economy. So as the investment rates started reducing, the GDP growth rate also started coming down. So as you can see, in the year 2015-16, our GDP growth rate was 8%. And slowly, the Indian economy started decelerating. And in the financial year 2019-20, the GDP growth rate got reduced to 4%. So even before the COVID, there was a slowdown. And then what happened? When 
India was affected by COVID-19 pandemic. You know, the government announced for the lockdown. So all the economic activity were closed down. People lost jobs. There was greater amount of economic uncertainty about the future. So the private sector companies did not make investment. So in a nutshell, India faced twin shocks to the Indian economy. What are these twin shocks? Twin shocks means that there was decline in the consumption expenditure as well as investment expenditure, both of which account for 85% of India's GDP. So there was decline in both investment as well as consumption expenditure, and we call it as twin shocks. Now, because of the twin shocks to the Indian economy, the GDP growth rate reduced to minus 7.2% in the last financial year. So as you know, the Indian economy registered negative GDP growth rate for the first time in the last 41 years since 1979-1980. Then what happened? See, when India was hit by COVID-19 pandemic, as I said, both consumption expenditure had got reduced and investment expenditure had also got reduced. So government thought that it should take the lead. Government should pump prime the Indian economy. So that is why what the government did was government took the lead and it started spending huge amount of money on the creation of capital assets, such as roads, railways, ports, airports, etc. So when government takes a lead, when government is, you know, spending more amount of money on creation of capital assets, automatically it will lead to increase in consumption expenditure, increase in investment expenditure. And that is why, that is why we have seen an increase in our GDP growth rate from minus 7.2, 9.2%. So this financial year, the Indian economy is expected to register a growth rate of 9.2%. And in the next year, it is expected to register a growth rate of 8 to 8.5 percent. Now, think about this very carefully. I'm going to make a statement here. Can I say that this strong recovery that we had had, is it predominantly because of government taking the lead, right? Government took the lead and pump prime the Indian economy focus more upon stimulus measures such as Atma Nirbha Bharat package. That is why we have had this strong recovery from minus 7.2 to 9.2 percent. So this is, has been possible mainly because of government taking the lead. But a number of concerns have been raised with respect to this kind of V-shaped recovery. What are the concerns? Let me discuss this. First and foremost, how do you calculate the GDP growth rate of our economy in a particular year? What we do is we take into account the real GDP in the current year minus real GDP in the previous year divided by the real GDP in the previous year, right? This is how we calculate the GDP growth rate in a, for the current year. Now look at the denominator real GDP in the base previous year. Now, can I say that this GDP growth rate in the current year is in turn dependent upon this denominator or the base? If the real GDP in the previous year is lower, then automatically the GDP growth rate in the present financial year will be higher. Similarly, if the real GDP in the previous financial year is higher, then the GDP growth rate in the current financial year will be lower. Right now, very carefully look at these figures here. Here I have denoted the real GDP for the year 21, 22. As to what would be the real GDP for the present financial year. And for the previous financial year, this is my real GDP, 135 lakh crores. So how will I calculate the GDP growth rate here? 146 lakh crores minus 135 lakh crores divided by 135 lakh crores. So can I say, can I say that the base in this case is lower, right? Because there was a contraction in the GDP size. So because there was a contraction in the GDP size, because the base was lower, the GDP growth rate for us 
is showing it as 9.2 percent. So this higher GDP growth rate is to a large extent because of the base effect of 135 lakh crores. That's the first concern. Second concern. Please focus on the board here. Look at the real GDP for the year 21-22. How much it is? 146 lakh crores. Look at the real GDP for the year 2019-20. How much it is? 147 lakh crores. So can I say we are back to square one now? Are you getting this point? We are back to square one. We Our real GDP right now is the real GDP what we had two years back. So can I say here that we have lost two years of GDP growth? We have lost two years of GDP growth. So that is the second most important problem. Apart from that, if you see here, number of economists have highlighted that whatever strong V-shaped recovery that we had, it was possible only in the short run. In the medium run, probably we could have W-shaped recovery or a K-shaped recovery. What is this W-shaped recovery? W-shaped recovery means a sharp decline in economic activity accompanied by revival and once again decline and then the revival. So we could have this kind of recovery. Question is why? See, as I said, this strong recovery, right? This strong recovery was possible because of enhanced government expenditure. But economists have highlighted that even today, even today, private final consumption expenditure and gross capital formation are yet to reach, are yet to register the growth rates which they were registering before the COVID-19 pandemic. So the consumption expenditure and investment expenditure has still yet to revive completely to pre-COVID levels. And if consumption expenditure and investment expenditure don't get revived, we will not continue to have this V-shaped economic recovery in the medium and long run. So even today, as you can see, a number of people have lost jobs in the informal sector. There is emergence of new variants such as Omicron. And then even today, there is poor sentiments among the consumers as well as private companies about the future of Indian economy. So this is a problem. Not just that, some economists have also highlighted that we are probably facing a K-shaped economic recovery. Now, what is K-shaped economic recovery? As you can see, you have two arrows here, which are diverging in different directions, which shows the uneven recovery of the Indian economy. Some sectors have strongly recovered. Some sectors are yet to recover to the pre-COVID levels. For example, IT BPO services have recovered. But contact intensive sectors such as hotel, travel, tourism are yet to recover. Formal sector has recovered, whereas informal sector is yet to recover. Similarly, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the government infused huge amount of liquidity into the economy. But it is being said that this increase in liquidity or the stimulus measures has basically benefited the richer class more than the poor class. So that is why we are having growing inequalities in the Indian economy. Are you getting this point? Now, just imagine if you were the finance minister of India, what would be your priority? What would you do? Now, as I said, even now, even now, private final consumption expenditure and gross capital formation are yet to register the growth rates, which they used to register before COVID. So you as a finance minister, your priority would be to enhance these two major drivers of economy, right? This would be your priority. First one. Second, as I said, some economists have said that India is probably having a K-shaped economic recovery. So your priority would be to address the growing inequalities in the Indian economy, right? So as a finance minister, priorities would be two. One, to pump prime the Indian economy, to increase the investment expenditure, to increase the consumption expenditure. That is one thing. 
and second one is to promote inclusive growth and development so if you look at the priority areas of this year's budget the priority areas of this year's budget is capital expenditure and second one is with respect to promoting inclusive growth and development are we clear on this yes so let's understand as to what is the blueprint for the amrit kal that is how should india transition from india at 75 to india at 100 so this is the blueprint as highlighted by the finance minister can you look at the blueprint here first and foremost government is going to continue on the capital expenditure focus on creation of assets roads railways ports airports etc the idea here is if the government is pump priming the economy if the government is taking a lead automatically we will crowd in private investment it will lead to increase in jobs promote inclusive growth higher gdp and higher exports increase in income and higher consumption expenditure so can i say when government is focusing on capital expenditure we are reviving gross capital formation gcf we are reviving consumption expenditure both of which are the major drivers of indian economy and we are also promoting inclusive growth and development that is why as you can see on the board the finance minister has given a lot of emphasis on the capital expenditure this year in terms of absolute value the capital expenditure has increased to 7.5 lakh crores in this financial year accounting for approximately around 3% of india's gdp this is the money which the government is going to spend directly that is the central government apart from that i hope you must be knowing that the central government also gives grants to states for creation of assets for example you have mg narega pradhan mantri gram sadak yojana pradhan mantri krishi sichai yojana pradhan mantri awas yojana so under these centrally sponsored schemes the central government gives grants to states for creation of assets right so if you include that also that is whatever money the central government is spending on its own plus the grants which the center is giving to states for the creation of capital assets what we get is the effective capital expenditure so this effective capital expenditure has increased to 10.6 lakh crores accounting for 4.1% of india's gdp so there has been substantial increase in terms of capital expenditure now in what way you can use these points first and foremost this part blueprint for amrit kal this you could incorporate it directly while writing an answer in the mains examination the blueprint the flow chart you can use it directly similarly these facts and figures with respect to capital expenditure you can incorporate it while writing an answer in gs paper 3 indian economy that this is how the government is focusing on capital expenditure are we clear yes so let's move to the first important theme so as i said this year's budget has focus on four priority areas pradhan mantri gati shakti inclusive growth and development productivity enhancement and financing of investment so under these priority areas the finance minister has announced the initiatives but as highlighted at the start of the class we are not going to discuss the budget in sequential order we are going to convert the budget into exam centric knowledge so what i have done here is all the initiatives announced in this year's budget i have put them under different themes for example the focus has been on infrastructure sector so these are the major and minor initiatives as far as infrastructure sector is concerned then you have initiatives related to banking and finance agriculture industry sustainable development and social sector okay so let's start with the first major dominant theme of infrastructure sector under the infrastructure sector the most important uh, highlight has been the pradhan mantri gati shakti master plan so the finance minister has announced that the pradhan mantri gati shakti master plan would be the focal point as far as the implementation of infrastructure projects in india is concerned 
So in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to discuss everything that you need to know as far as Gati Shakti master plan is concerned. Are we clear on this? At the end of this session, uh, that is at the end of this 10 to 15 minutes, we'll come back and uh, solve one, two, three practice questions. And this is the main question for practice. The question is discuss the potential of Gati Shakti master plan in addressing the present problems in the infrastructure sector, leading to strong foundation of Atmanirbhar Bharat. So let's get into the discussion of Pradhan Mantri Gati Shakti master plan. See, in order to make your work easier so that you can revise the budget later on, what I have done this time is all the important topics, all the major announcements, I have incorporated them in a form of a mind map. Can you see this mind map? So everything, everything that you need to know with respect to Gati Shakti master plan is in this form of mind map. So these kind of mind maps are prepared for each and every major initiative, such as Gati Shakti master plan, battery swapping policy, central bank digital currency, and so on. So let's get into the discussion of Gati Shakti master plan. I hope you all know the importance of infrastructure sector. The infrastructure sector has a local multiplier effect of 2.45, which means that every one rupee that you spend, it yields a return of 2.45. It can boost investment expenditure, convers uh, you know, consumption expenditure. It can create jobs, promote inclusive growth, reduce the logistic cost in India, which is quite higher at 12 to 14% of India's GDP. And it can lay down a strong vision of Atmanirbhar Bharat. If you have seen this year's mains examination, right? The question was discussed as to how infrastructure sector can promote faster inclusive growth. So to write an answer to that question, you could have incorporated these points. Secondly, the government has taken a number of initiatives in the infrastructure sector. The most important one is NIP, National Infrastructure Pipeline. With respect to National Infrastructure Pipeline, different data, different facts and figures have been given in different sources. In some sources, it has been mentioned that NIP accounts for 100 crores, 100 lakh crores. In some sources, it has been mentioned at 102 lakh crores. And in some sources, it has been mentioned as triple one lakh crores. Now, the most authentic source to know the data related to NIP is the economic survey. And according to economic survey, the national infrastructure pipeline seeks to spend triple one lakh crores over the next five years for the creation of world-class infrastructure. So please remember this data. It is from the authentic source of economic survey. The funding for NIP is going to come from center states as well as the private sector. The funding by the center is 39%. By the states, it is 40%. And by the private sector, it is 21%. Once again, in some of the sources, it has been mentioned that center and state would contribute 39% each. They have mentioned that even the state government would contribute 39%. But I'm taking this data from the economic survey. Apart from that, the government is going to create world-class infrastructure such as roads, railways, ports, airports, etc. Among various infrastructure projects, the highest allocation is provided for energy sector. Please remember this from the perspective of PLMs. Energy sector accounts for the highest share. Then we have launched National Bank for Financing Infrastructure Development last year. So in the last year's budget, I've discussed uh, everything related to the development bank, which we have launched last year. And then we have recently launched national monetization pipeline. Very important from the perspective of prelims examination is focus here. Under the national monetization pipeline, what we are going to do here is there are certain assets which are created by the government of India. But these assets as such are not efficiently utilized. They are underutilized. 
for example roads railways ports airports stadium telecom towers etc so all of these assets which are inefficiently utilized we are going to lease out these assets to the private sector for the next 20 to 25 years so by leasing out these underutilized assets we are going to raise 6 lakh crores and this money we are in turn going to spend on the creation of new infrastructure projects so this is what is asset recycling i hope you must have heard about this right but at the same time i would want to highlight some important aspects of monetization pipeline which could be tricky as far as prelims examination is concerned first thing is national monetization pipeline is not privatization it's not privatization because we are not selling of the assets we are just leasing out the assets secondly india is not the first country to go for such an initiative even prior to india countries such as australia indonesia have already gone for monetization of their assets in australia it was asset recycling initiative and in indonesia it was limited concession scheme and the third and most important part is see the assets of the government can be categorized into broad assets uh, sorry the core assets and the non core assets the core assets would obviously include roads railways ports airports etc the non core assets would include land buildings etc national monetization pipeline covers the monetization of only the core assets only core assets are to be monetized and not the non core assets such as land buildings so we are not going to lease out land we are not going to lease out buildings under the national monetization pipeline important from the perspective of the prelims examination now coming to the challenges part see in for such a sector all the time the government comes up with the ambitious plans for the in for such a sector every year the government says that hum is saal itna infrastructure banayenge itna uh, roads banayenge itna railways line banayenge all of those things but this plan never get materialized so it's something like you know the goa trip that we used to plan in our college days you remember when we are in college days we always used to plan for the goa trip every year and that plan never used to get materialized because one or the other person used to drop out and finally the plan itself used to get shelved so creation of infrastructure for the government is same like the goa trip for us government comes up with the ambitious plans but never materializes these plans why poor implementation why are we unable to implement the infrastructure projects see right now we have multiple ministries and departments involved in creation of infrastructure projects for example you have ministry of road transport and highways ministry of shipping inland waterways ministry of civil aviation ministry of commerce and industry and so on all of these multiple ministries and department they work in silos that is they work independently without coordinating with each other since they are working independently one ministry will not be aware about the projects which are being planned or implemented by other ministry this in turn leads to unnecessary delays and cost overruns let me give you two example to substantiate this now let's say you must have seen in india that we have constructed a new road once a road is newly constructed other government agency realizes that acha road to ban gaya पर हमने वाटर पाइपलाइन डालना भूल गया था राइट दैट नॉर्मली हैपेंस सो व्हाट हैपेंस इज अ न्यूली कंस्ट्रक्टेड रोड इज डग आउट एंड वाटर पाइपलाइन इज लेड डाउन एंड वंस अगेन द रोड इज कंस्ट्रक्टेड व्हाट डज इट लीड टू इट लीड्स टू डिलेस इट लीड्स टू कॉस्ट ओवरन्स सिमिलरली वी ऑलवेज कीप टॉकिंग अबाउट मल्टी मॉडल कनेक्टिविटी मल्टी मॉडल कनेक्टिविटी बट दिस नेवर गेट्स मटेरियलाइज्ड व्हाई नाउ फॉर एग्जांपल लेट्स से वी आर प्लानिंग टू कंस्ट्रक्ट अ इंडस्ट्रियल हब near noida for example now this industrial hub should have multimodal connectivity that is it should have connectivity through roads connectivity through railways connected connectivity through aviation and so on this requires coordination between multiple ministries and departments 
but it never gets materialized once again because lack of coordination that is why that is why you must have repeatedly heard that the logistic cost in case of india is much higher at 12 to 14% of india's gdp in other countries it is hardly around 8 to 10% higher logistic cost is affecting our manufacturing competitiveness it is preventing us from having an export led model are you understanding these problems right so how do you address these problems already as far as financing is concerned we have taken these initiatives but the question is how do you implement this so as far as implementation is concerned that is where pradhan mantri gati shakti master plan comes into picture so when this program was launched by prime minister modi modi said that gati shakti master plan would provide gati that is speed and shakti that is strength to the creation of infrastructure sector so gati shakti master plan is going to bring 16 government ministries and departments on a single platform so by bringing 16 ministries and departments on a single platform we are able to achieve coordination synergy in their efforts one ministry will be aware about the infrastructure projects which are planned and implemented by other ministry so much higher coordination under the gati shakti master plan we are going to monitor projects for rupees 1000 crores we are going to incorporate various schemes such as bharat mala sagar mala udan we are going to focus on multimodal connectivity we are going to leverage uh, the spatial technology for better planning of infrastructure projects and as far as the nodal ministry for gati shakti master plan is concerned this is uh, department for promotion of industry and internal trade and to monitor the projects we have set up a empowered committee headed by the cabinet secretary so please remember this important from the perspective of your prelims examination the question is how are we going to uh, how this gati shakti master plan is going to have better implementation of infrastructure projects so as i said it is going to promote coordination and synergy between government ministries and departments so we are going to have a centralized uh, portal to bring all the ministries and departments it will promote greater synergy between ministries and departments we are going to reduce delays in cost overruns through prioritization of projects so what is this prioritization of projects as part of prioritization of projects we are going to execute the projects in a sequential order we'll first identify which project should be executed first and which project has to be executed later for example as i said if a road is to be laid down first the water pipelines have to have to be laid down and then the road has to be constructed so this kind of prioritization we are going to do second we are going to execute closely linked projects together now let me give an example to substantiate this in case of india we have something known as utility corridors these utility corridors run parallel to the national highways so you have national highway just beside the national highway the ground is dug out then underground the utility pipelines are laid down utility pipelines such as water pipeline power cables telephone connection broadband connection so all of these utility corridors are laid down just beside the national highway so can i say construction of national highway laying down of utility corridor can be executed together yes both of these things can go together and the most important benefit is when the road reaches the village normally in case of india what happens is initially the road is constructed it reaches a village and the village would have to wait for another 4 to 5 years to get the water connection electricity connection telephone connection broadband connection but in this case as soon as the road reaches the utility lines will also reach the village so this is the beauty of the gati shakti master plan and lastly we are going to provide for single window approval mechanism for the faster execution and environmental clearances so we are also going to reduce the gap between planning and implementation to adoption of technology and by providing multimodal connectivity and reducing the logistic cost so this is as far as the gati shakti master plan is concerned please have a look at this
practice MCQ number one and uh, let me know the answer in the chat box. Fast. With reference to Gadi Shakti master plan, which among the following statements is incorrect. Yes, I would want each one of you to respond. So you know the answer. Answer is this. This is incorrect. It is not Ministry of Finance. It is Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade. Look at practice MCQ number two. What do you think is the answer? Yes, the answer is A, that is one only. Two and three are wrong. It's not the road sector, rather it is the energy sector. Look at practice MCQ number three. India is the first country in the world to have come up with such an initiative for financing infrastructure. No, prior to India, we had Australia, Indonesia. It includes monetization of both core and non-core assets. No, it includes monetization of only the core assets and not the non-core assets. And hence the answer would be neither one nor two. So similar to this practice question, I have incorporated the other practice questions also for all the major themes. So it's not possible for me to discuss each and every practice question in the class. So once we are done with the class, we will provide you, the, uh, you with a link for the quiz from the Union Budget 22-23. You can click on the link and attempt the quiz on the eLearn platform. And in case if you're not registered on the eLearn platform so far, you can register on the eLearn platform and then attempt the quiz. Clear? Okay. Raj Kishore. Yes, sir. Are you able to hear my voice properly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Nee, actually, you have a band. 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 You Okay, now coming to the next one. Battery swapping policy. Battery swapping policy need benefits and challenges. So once again, in next 10 minutes, we are going to discuss everything related to the battery swapping policy, which the finance minister has announced this year's budget. Subsequent to that, we will uh, solve these three practice questions, which will be solved on the eLearn platform and then you have this main question for practice. The question here is battery swapping policy announced in the union budget 22, 23 is a step in the right direction and would help in enhance penetration of electric mobility in India discuss. So let's discuss all aspects related to the battery swapping policy and how it will help in promotion of electric mobility in India. Okay. So this is a mind map for the battery swapping policy. So we all know that why are we promoting electric mobility? Because it will help us address climate change and enable India to meet the nationally determined contributions as enunciated under the Paris climate change deal. It will help us reduce the urban air pollution and it will help us achieve energy security. That is by avoiding the import of crude oil. As far as the present status of electric mobility in India is concerned, last financial year, the electric vehicles 
accounted for just 1.3% of the total vehicles sold in India. Whereas if you look at countries such as Norway, Iceland, the percentage of electric vehicles sold in their countries is much, much higher. In Norway, it is 75%. In Iceland, it is 45%. And as far as China is concerned, China has been a global leader in terms of absolute sale of electric vehicles anywhere across the globe. So in order to promote electric mobility, the government has taken a number of initiatives. First and foremost, we have set up the institutional structure. As part of the institutional structure, please remember this thing, which is important from prelims. In India, the nodal ministry for promotion of electric mobility is a ministry for heavy industries. It is not ministry of road transport and highways. It is the ministry for heavy industries, which is a nodal ministry. So we have this national council for electric mobility, which is headed by the minister for heavy industries. So this national council will in turn lay down various schemes, policies, initiatives for the promotion of electric mobility in India. Right now, this ministry of highway industries is implementing fame to scheme. Apart from that, we have launched production linked incentive scheme, PLI scheme in order to encourage the production of electric vehicles as well as the electric batteries. But, but focus on this because this is a recent initiative. We have launched first loss risk sharing instrument, which is an initiative of Niti Aayog and World Bank. So what is this initiative of first loss risk sharing? So right now, almost around 70 to 80 percent of vehicles which are sold in India, they are financed by banks. That is, banks give loans to people for buying uh, uh, cars as such. But when it comes to electric vehicles, banks are reluctant to give loans to the customers on buying electric vehicles because they see a much higher risk involved. So banks normally give loans for internal combustion vehicles, but less loans for electric vehicles. So in order to encourage the banks to give more loans to the customers for buying electric vehicles, Niti Aayog and World Bank have launched first loss risk sharing instrument worth $300 million. It's a recent initiative. How will this initiative work? Under this initiative, Let's say I would want to buy a Tata Nexon electric vehicle. So in this case, I'll approach the bank. The bank normally will be reluctant to give loans to me. So that is where the first loss risk sharing instrument will come in. It will say, give loans to this customer. And if this customer fails to repay the loans in future, we will pay you the money on your, the behalf of the customer. So in case I fail to repay the loans to the bank, the first loss risk sharing instrument will compensate the banks for the loss. So this is what first loss risk sharing. So if the, if the bank is incurring a loss, the risk will fall on the world bank and Niti IU. Are we clear now? Right. Apart from that, I hope most of you must be knowing about priority sector lending, PSL lending. So as part of priority sector lending, 40% of the loans are required to be given to the sectors which are being classified as the priority sectors. Right now, electric vehicles are not part of the priority sector lending. They're not part of the priority sector lending. But recently, Niti Aayog has recommended that in future, the loans which the banks give to electric vehicles, they should also be categorized as priority loans, priority sector loans. So this is just a recommendation, but so far not accepted so far. Now, we are going to discuss as to how this battery swapping policy is going to work. In the year 2017-18, the Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways came up with a notification. As part of this notification, if a customer wants to buy an electric vehicle without an electric battery, he can very well do so. So if you want to buy an electric vehicle with an, without an electric battery, you can buy that. That was a notification issued by Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways. Subsequently, what has happened is you, when you want to buy an electric vehicle, you can buy an electric vehicle without the electric battery. Now you must be wondering 
what is the use of electric vehicle if i don't have electric battery so that is where that is where the battery swapping policy comes into picture now for example in case of india we have a electric two wheeler company known as bonds infinity this bonds infinity when it is selling its electric scooters to the customers it provides two options option number 1 you can buy an electric scooter with an electric battery option number 2 you can buy an electric scooter without an electric battery as far as electric battery is concerned you can lease in the electric battery or you can subscribe for the electric battery so just like how you subscribe for your netflix amazon etc right similar to that you can subscribe to the electric battery so you can lease in the electric battery or subscribe to the electric battery either from the company which is selling you the electric vehicle or we will have separate private entities which will be managing the battery swapping stations so you have two options so in this case what you will do is you will not own the battery you will simply you know own the vehicle whenever you want battery the you will use the battery once the battery is going to get fully discharged you will replace the old battery with a newly recharged battery and then you will continue with your travel so recently it has been reported in media that bonds infinity has achieved 10 lakh battery swaps so far apart from that recently it was also reported that reliance company and bp they have come up with a joint venture to set up battery swapping stations across india now in what way the government is going to promote battery swapping policy we are not sure so far because in the budget the finance minister has not highlighted about the broad contours of this policy but what we know from the media reports is that the government may provide you with the incentives on the battery swapping now for example right now you must be knowing that under the fame 2 scheme the government is giving demand incentive to the customers on buying electric vehicle so let's say the cost of uh, ola e scooter is 1.5 lakhs you don't have to pay the entire 1.5 lakhs you will pay just 1 lakh remaining 50000 the government will give that money on your behalf to the dealer that is how the fame 2 scheme would work in future the government under the fame 2 scheme may also give you incentive on leasing or subscription of the battery for example say for leasing of battery you are required to pay 1000 rupees i'm just giving an example let's say you are required to pay 1000 rupees 20% of that 20% of that that is rupees 200 probably the government will give you as an incentive but once again i'm highlighting this broad contours of the policy are not available in the public domain but this is what has been shown as per the media reports the question is how this battery swapping policy is going to benefit us first thing here see if you look at the electric vehicles the electric vehicles are very costly and one of the main reason is that the cost of electric batteries is very higher the electric batteries alone account for almost 50% of the cost of electric vehicle for example if you look at tata nexon ev the on road price of tata nexon ev in delhi is approximately around 14 lakh but the same petrol version of tata nexon comes in 7 to 8 lakhs so the cost is higher because of the higher cost of the battery which account accounts for 50% so if you are buying an electric vehicle without an electric electric battery automatically the initial cost of electric vehicle will come down so it will encourage the people to adopt electric mobility that's the first benefit second benefit is now let's say i am buying an electric vehicle along with a electric battery and we know that there is a limited time span for which you can use this electric battery or the electric battery can be you know uh, recharged for a limited cycles for example a 1 kilowatt battery can be recharged for say 2500 to 3000 times after that you need to replace your old battery with a new battery that is in case if you are owning the electric vehicle along with a electric battery but in case of battery swapping you are not owning the battery at all so automatically the maintenance cost will come down this is second benefit 
The third benefit is one of the problems as to why people have not adopted electric mobility in case of India is two reasons. One, the time taken for charging normally it takes six to eight hours to fully charge an electric vehicle and the maximum range which it can travel that is approximately around 250 to 300 kilometers. So that is one of the reason as to why people have not adopted electric mobility. The battery swapping policy will address anxiety issues related to the time as well as the range of the vehicles. So let's say if I want to travel from Delhi to Mumbai in my electric vehicle now, probably I'll have to think twice. But once the battery swapping policy comes into picture, I can easily travel from Delhi to Mumbai on my electric vehicle. So let's say along the national highway, there are battery swapping stations. I can easily swap the discharge battery with the new charged battery and then continue with my travel. So that is why it is said that battery swapping policy will encourage electric mobility. But once again, there are a number of challenges. The first challenge is battery swapping policy can be possible or it will be successful only when the electric vehicles come up with removable batteries. So batteries should be able to be removed and then replaced with the newly charged batteries. So battery swapping policy would be successful only when the vehicles come up with the removable batteries. But the problem in case of India is only some companies provide for removable batteries. The example I gave you, Bonds Infinity provides for removable batteries, but Ola e-scooter does not provide for removable batteries. Its batteries have got integrated into vehicle. You can't you not know, take out the battery. So that is one problem. The second problem is with respect to interoperability standards. It basically means that electric battery of one company should be allowed to function on the electric vehicle manufactured by another, another company. So let's say the electric battery in Ola e-scooter, this electric battery should be, be allowed to be used even on Aether e-scooter or Hero electric scooter. So we need to have this interoperability standards, uniform standards as far as battery is concerned. Government has said that we will come up with the uniform standards, we'll come up with the interoperability standards, but it will take time. Third is with respect to the number of electric batteries which are needed. So right now, what people are doing? People buy electric vehicle along with the battery, right? So we need one electric battery for one electric vehicle, right? Now in future, when we go for battery swapping, can I say we would probably need two electric batteries for one vehicle? One electric battery will be always a part of the electric vehicle and one electric battery will be on standby. So don't you think we need more number of electric batteries? So because we need more number of electric batteries, we need to ramp up the production of electric batteries in India. So that's the third challenge. Fourth, most of the people who own electric e-scooters, they don't prefer battery swapping. The reason being these people who own electric scooters, they prefer to charge their electric scooters at home, especially during the night time. So the preference for electric uh, uh, swapping, battery swapping could be lower among these people. Next is high GST rates on batteries. Please make a note that I mentioned that as 15%, it's not 15%, it's 18%. That's a mistake here. It's, it's not 15, it's 18%. So GST rate on standalone batteries is much higher, 18%. So that's the problem. So we need to reduce the GST rates on batteries. And the last and most important problem is, <clears throat> see, when you charge the electric battery, for the first time, second time, its performance will be high. But as the number of charging cycles increases, its performance will start coming down, right? First time you charge it, probably it will travel for 250 kilometers. But if you charge it for 2000 time, its range will probably come down to 125. So performance of the battery will keep on reducing with the number of the charging cycles. So what the battery swapping stations what they will do is they'll try to replace the low performance battery with the high performance batteries. So in future, we will come across large number of low performance batteries in India. So we need to provide for a corrective framework to recycle these old batteries so that it does not cause environmental problems. So that is what we need to address that.
So that's the last challenge as far as battery swapping policy is concerned. So in the UPSC mains examination, you could probably get a question uh, with respect to critical analysis of battery swapping policy. So when it says critical analysis, right? Benefits and challenges. So you have benefits, you have challenges. Are we clear on this? Okay. <clears throat> okay, next is harmonized uh, list of infrastructure. So let's understand this harmonized list of infrastructure. In the budget, the finance minister has announced that data centers and energy storage systems, energy storage systems such as charging stations, battery swapping stations, etc., they will be given the status of infrastructure in India. And they will be included in the harmonized list of infrastructure. This is the announcement. But do you think UPSC will likely ask you this question? No. UPSC will probably ask you a question related to harmonized list of infrastructure. That is who publishes the list, which uh, uh, sectors have been included in the harmonized list, what benefits does the sector get? So those things become important. So see, we, in case of India, when we think of infrastructure, the first thing that comes to your mind is roads, railways, ports, airports, etc. But there's no common definition as to what is infrastructure sector in India. So in order to have a common definition, common understanding of what is infrastructure sector, the Ministry of Finance publishes the harmonized list of infrastructure. This list is published by whom? Ministry of Infrastructure. So right now we have five main sectors and 34 subsectors in the harmonized list of infrastructure. So you have transport and please have a look at this. Even logistics sector has been given the status of infrastructure. You have water and sanitation, communication, social and commercial, such as educational institution, sports, hospitals, tourism, affordable housing. And this is the latest entry, exhibition and convention centers. This is the latest entry. And on top of that, now data centers and energy storage systems are included in the harmonized list of infrastructure. What benefits does the sector get if it's included in the harmonized list? First and foremost, they can have access to long-term credit from banks and financial institutions at affordable rates. They can have easier access to long-term funds from insurance companies, easier access to external commercial borrowings. They would become eligible to borrow money from development banks such as India Infrastructure Finance Company. And they also can access uh, loans from soaring wealth funds of other countries. So these are the benefits. So please keep in mind as to what benefits does the sector gets when it is included in the harmonized list of infrastructure. Next, scheme for financial assistance to the states. So as far as this topic is concerned, you must understand about the borrowing powers of the center, borrowing powers of the states, limits on the borrowing powers of the states, and some details about this scheme. So let's understand these things. So with respect to borrowing powers of the center and states, we have constitutional provisions of Article 292 and Article 293. Under Article 292, the central government can borrow money both within India as well as outside India based upon a limit set by parliament through law. And we know that already in case of India, this law is in form of FRBM Act. So the FRBM Act puts a limit on how much money the central government can borrow. As far as the state government is concerned, the state government can borrow money from market that is through issuance of state development loans. The state government can borrow money from the RBI in the form of ways and means advances. And the state government can also borrow money from the central government. But there is a restriction here on the borrowing powers of the state government. What is that restriction? The restriction is if a particular state government has taken a loan from the center and has not completely repaid the loans, 
in that case the state government if it wants to borrow loans from the market the state government would need prior approval of the central government for example let's say the central government has given loans to the government of karnataka worth rupees 1 lakh crores out of this 1 lakh crore the government of karnataka has paid back 90000 crores so can i say still there is an outstanding loan of 10000 crores right since there is an outstanding loan of 10000 crores government of karnataka cannot borrow money from the market without the prior approval of the center are you getting this point it so happens it so happens that all the state governments are indebted to the center all the state governments have outstanding loans from the center which effectively means that the central government can control how much money the government the state governments can borrow from the market so accordingly the state the central government earlier it had imposed a limit that the state governments cannot borrow more than 3% of their gross state domestic product so just like how we have under frbm act fiscal deficit cannot be more than 3% of gdp so similarly the central government has imposed that borrowing limit on the state government earlier because of covid 19 pandemic this limit was increased to 5% and now we have come back to 4% so you can have a look at here so there has been increase in borrowing from 3% to 4% now apart from that uh, the central government has also said that the state governments can borrow additional 0.5% but this additional 0.5% will not be given to all the states rather it will be given to only those states will bring about which bring about reforms in the distribution sector power discoms okay now this important question can the state governments borrow money from abroad in the year 2017 the union cabinet came up with a policy this policy has in turn enabled the financially sound sound states to borrow money directly from international agencies such as world bank asian development bank asian infrastructure investment bank and so on so they can directly borrow money from international agencies but in each of these cases the central government will act as a guarantor so that is important now coming to scheme for financial assistance to states see we have discussed that the budget has given a lot of philip impetus to the creation of infrastructure so this is one step as part of that under scheme for the financial assistance to states the central government gives 50 year interest free loans to the state government two things are important duration of loans 50 year and second loans are given without any interest interest free loans for the present financial year the government had allocated 15000 crores to the state government and for the next financial year we have increased this limit to further to 1 lakh crores and the finance minister has announced that whatever uh, assistance the center is giving to the states that uh, loans will not be considered for calculating the limits on borrowing we know the limit on borrowing is 4% of gross state domestic product so we will not include these loans under that particular limit it will be over and above the borrowing limits so these are some things which you need to know as far as this particular announcement is concerned next is a new scheme known as pm divine that is pradhan mantri's a prime minister's development initiative for the northeastern part of india so we all know the problems in the northeastern part of india the northeastern part of india is connected with the rest of india through the narrow chikanek corridor so there is lack of infrastructure development in the northeastern part of india so poor connectivity poor infrastructure is adversely affecting the livelihood opportunities of the people in the northeast the under development or lack of development in northeast is also giving rise to extremism militancy and etc so in order to promote holistic development of the northeastern part of india the finance minister has announced the prime minister's development initiative for the northeastern region most important thing from the perspective of prelims is that this scheme is going to be implemented by northeastern council please make a note of that 
and how you can use it in the mains examination see in mains examination you have a topic of development and extremism right so you can directly incorporate this thing while uh, as a fodder point while writing an answer in mains examination next is a vibrant villages scheme okay this is interesting here now if you look at india's northern border with china especially in states such as uh, uttarakhand himachal pradesh and arunachal pradesh there is a greater amount of asymmetry in terms of infrastructure between india and china in the last few years china has significantly ramped up its infrastructure along the border with india in fact china has launched a new scheme known as well of villages as part of well of villages china is focusing on integrated development of border villages on its side but if you look at the india's side of border the story is completely different the border villages in india they do not have all weather connectivity they do not have basic infrastructure such as schools hospitals they do not have telephone connection and so on and because of lack of development in these border villages these border villages are turning into kind of ghost villages ghost villages means people are migrating from these border villages back into the hinterland so on one side the villages along the china's border china, uh, in china they are booming they are increasing numbers whereas in our side we are seeing a large number of ghost villages because of out migration of people this has both development significance as well as strategic significance development significance is because we are not able to promote development in the border villages but but it has strategic significance also we know that china has not clearly well defined the line of actual control and if our border villages become ghost villages in future it will become very easier for china to assert its claims over these regions right so don't you think we need to promote employment opportunities and develop these border villages so that is why that is why the finance minister has announced a new scheme known as vibrant villages scheme so here we are going to focus upon the development of border villages along india's northern border with china specifically in states such as uttarakhand himachal pradesh and arunachal pradesh next is parvatmala program so under the parvatmala program it is basically we are going to develop the rope ways in the hilly states so it's also ca called as national rope way development program when we develop the rope ways in the hilly states it will be able to provide all weather connectivity it will be able to promote tourism employment opportunities in these hilly states so that is what you must know as far as parvatmala program is concerned next look, let's look at some micro initiatives some small initiatives in infrastructure sector one is the road transport where we have declared that we will come up with the express ways for the faster movement of people and goods and then the railways in the railways the most important initiative has been on one station one product now what is this one station one product i hope all of you must have heard about one district one product right so prime minister modi when he was launching this one district one product he had very beautifully highlighted that each and every district in india has an export potential which is equivalent to the export potential of small size country in europe so whatever a small size country in europe can export the same export potential lies hidden in india's districts but we are unable to tap into these products so as part of one district one product we are going to identify districts which have certain unique products and promote these products for example i hope you must have heard of arubu coffee arubu coffee comes from visakhapatnam you have must have heard about guntur chilies comes from guntur district of andhra pradesh then in karnataka you have chenna patna toys then you have another district called as haveri in haveri you have badgi chilies so different districts in india are well known for certain products so what we need to do is we need to uh, we need to create efficient supply chain so that these products reach every nook and corner of india 
this will benefit the farmers this will benefit the rural artisans this will benefit the micro small and medium enterprises so that is where the one station one product is in line with one district one product so each and every railway station in india will focus upon specializing in creating efficient market supply chain for a product which is famous in that particular region so that is one station one product the other initiatives they are minor initiatives i hope you can read them and understand I'm not going to focus on that next is parivesh portal don't even bother to remember the full form just remember about the parivesh portal so parivesh portal is a portal which is you know operated by ministry of environment forest and climate change this particular portal uh, is a single window portal for giving all kinds of environmental clearances so if a particular project developer wants environmental clearances either from the center agencies state government agencies or the district level agencies on this parivesh portal he can uh, give his proposal or to get a, a permission for getting the clearances once he uploads the documents automatically he'll get a unique id through this unique id he will be able to track the status of his approval so it's a single window mechanism so finance minister has announced that the scope of parivesh portal would be further expanded not really needed from the perspective of parents but you just understand as to what is parivesh portal and understand that it is operated by the ministry of environment forest and climate change okay fine so finally we are done with the first uh, theme that is infrastructure sector we have discussed all of this <clears throat> related to infrastructure now we are going to jump into the next theme that is banking and finance this is the next theme of banking and finance so as you can see under banking and finance you have all of these initiatives the most important initiative is introduction of central bank digital currency okay look at the practice questions especially the practice question number 15 which among the following are the likely benefits of introduction of central bank digital currency in india then you have these two mains question for practice what are the essential features of central bank digital currency discuss as to how introduction of central bank digital currency can benefit indian economy and then while the introduction of central bank digital currency can have advantages its issuance calls for cautious optimism in the light of this statement analyze the concerns related to central bank digital currency what are the concerns so in the next 15 to 20 minutes we are going to discuss everything everything that you need to know as far as central bank digital currency is concerned so let's understand all of these things okay see we have seen a rapid rise of private cryptocurrencies as well as uh, you know some companies have also said that they'll come up with a stable coins like facebook it has said that it will come up with a stable coin called as diem d i e m which will be linked to dollar so on one hand we have seen rapid growth of private cryptocurrencies some companies such as facebook wants to come up with stable coins and uh, the growth of these currencies as such has a problem as far as indian economy is concerned as far as the private cryptocurrencies is concerned such as bitcoin we all know that they can be used for certain illegal purposes such as terror financing drug financing tax evasion and so on so there are problem with the private cryptocurrencies similar to that facebook has said it will launch a stable coin called as diem earlier it was called as libra now it is diem and they said that this coin as such it will be linked to dollar now just imagine in future when companies such as facebook launch such stable coins linked to dollar 
RBI believes that it can lead to monetary instability as well as external sector instability for India. Two challenges. First challenge is monetary instability and external instability. What is this monetary instability? Now, let's say in future, stable coins such as Diam become quite famous in India. Can I say that people will switch from Indian rupee to such stable coins? In a, you know, in future, this can happen. People may switch from rupees to such stable coins such as Diam. And if that happens, can I say, can I say, RBI will lose the control over the currency itself? Are you getting this point? RBI will lose the control of the currency itself because people will switch from Indian rupee to other stable coins linked to dollar. Don't you think it will lead to dollarization of world economy? Apart from that, let's look at external sector. Now, in case of India, we have put strict control on the capital account. So capital account, we have strict controls where RBI is controlling the capital account transactions. Imagine in future, if uh, currency stable coins, such as DM quite become quite famous, people can easily transfer money from India to other countries and from other countries to India or which RBI will not have any control. So can I say suddenly there could be a huge inflow of money and suddenly there could be a huge outflow of money. It can adversely impact the external sector. Are you getting this point? So as far as government is concerned, government believes that the private cryptocurrencies can be used for illegal purposes, such as terror financing, drug trafficking, and so on. As far as RBI is concerned, RBI believes that the stable coins can pose monetary instability and external sector instability. It is behind this backdrop. The finance minister has decided to announce that RBI will soon come out with a central bank digital currency, CBDC. Presently, if you look at RBI Act 1934, to be more specific, Section 22 of the RBI Act, under this particular section, RBI has been empowered to issue the currency notes. But when you say currency notes, currency notes means physical cash. Now what we are going to do is we are going to amend this section 22 of the RBI Act 1934. Through the amendment of this particular section, we will empower the RBI to issue digital money just like the way it is using issuing the physical cash. So this is a proposal. So just like how RBI issues the currency notes, RBI will issue digital money, central bank digital currency. That is a proposal. But I'm very sure most of you still have a confusion as to how this central bank digital currency, how is it different from cash? How is it different from the deposits that you keep with the bank? Or how is it different from the payments that you are right now making through Google Pay, Phone Pay, etc.? So I'm going to discuss differences between central bank digital currency with physical cash, deposits, and the payments that you are already making. First, let's see physical cash and central bank digital currency. What's the common between these two? Both physical cash and central bank digital currency are going to be issued by whom? By the Reserve Bank of India. Both physical cash and central bank digital currency are going to be legal tender for carrying out transactions. But what's the difference? Difference is the digital currency, you can't touch it and feel it. You can touch and feel the cash, but you can't touch and feel the central bank digital currency. That's the first difference. Second difference here is, see, as far as cash is concerned, cash transactions remain anonymous, right? When you make a payment, the government or the RBI will not know to whom you have made a payment, how much payment you have made. But, but if you make a payment to central bank digital currency, there is a traceability of transactions. So RBI will get to know to whom and how much money you have transferred through central bank digital currency. Are we clear on this? So physical cash and central bank digital currency are both same, but difference is you can't touch and feel central bank digital currency, right? And central bank digital currency has traceability. It's the first difference. 
now coming to how central bank digital currency are different from the deposits that you keep with the bank what's the main difference see when you want to deposits the money with the bank right what do you do you go to a bank such as icici bank you open an account with the icici bank and then you make the deposit so when you deposit the money with the icici bank can i say this becomes a liability of icici bank right the icici bank is liable to give you money when you demand it let's understand what happens in central bank digital currency in case of central bank digital currency you will approach the rbi you will open an account with the rbi in case of bank deposits with whom are you opening the account you are opening the account with the bank but in case of central bank digital currency with whom are you opening the account you are opening the account with the rbi itself and once you deposit or when rbi issues a central bank digital currency whose liability it will be will it be liability of bank no it will be liability of reserve bank of india itself direct liability are you getting on this part yes third and most important is see with respect to issuance of central bank digital currency there are two models direct model and the indirect model which is also referred to as two tiered model right now we are not at decided we are not at decided or we don't know for sure as which model will go for issuance of central bank digital currency but let me explain these two models in case of direct model of issuance of central bank digital currency you will approach the rbi the rbi itself will open an account for you so just like how you open an account with icici right In the same way you will approach the rbi it will give all the documents which are needed for kyc rbi will verify the documents give you the account not just that apart from that rbi will also help you to maintain that account rbi will also facilitate all the transactions to central bank digital currency so in this case in the direct model rbi is issuing central bank digital currency rbi is directly interacting with the people for opening an account rbi is maintaining the account and rbi is also facilitating the transactions so can i say in this case rbi becomes just like a normal bank so it's like rbi becoming the next sbi more people can approach rbi just open an account and then rbi will take care of everything that model is direct model what's a two tiered model or indirect model in this case two tiered model rbi will issue the central bank digital currency you will still maintain an account with the rbi but the customer facing activities the interaction with the customer rbi will not come into picture rather rbi will outsource this to other banks such as icici sdfc sbi etc so in the indirect model rbi is not interacting with the public but you are still having an account with the rbi itself so let's say if in the indirect model if i want to open uh, a central bank digital currency account i will uh, probably approach say icici bank so icici bank on behalf of the rbi will open an account for me with the rbi all other functions such as maintaining the account facilitating the transactions everything will be carried out by other banks so there are two models now take time and uh, think which model do you think is better for us direct model or indirect model in case of direct model can i say the burden on the rbi is going to increase substantially right because rbi will become the next state bank of india it has to interact with huge amount of people already rbi is overburdened on top of that if rbi starts interacting with people especially with respect to opening accounts maintaining accounts facilitating transactions burden is going to increase so i do feel that indirect model is the right model as far as issuance of central bank digital currency is concerned but as of now we are not very sure third how is central bank digital currency going to be different from the payments that you make through google pay phone pay paytm etc see in case of uh, google pay phone pay paytm let's say you are making a payment to the merchant 
what happens in this particular case your account gets debited and the merchant account gets credited right so it's a front end transaction but this front end transaction is in turn accompanied by back end transaction so at the back end level settlement between my bank and customer bank will take place so front end my bank account gets debited and the merchant's bank account gets credited but the back end the transaction the clearing will take place between my bank and merchant bank but in case of central bank digital currency when i am making a payment from my account to someone else direct payment takes place there is no settlement which is involved there as far as user experience is concerned user experience is not going to change so just like how you are going to make a payment through you no know, phone pay paytm etc the same way you are going to make a payment through central bank digital currency are we clear now so if you see here the mind map this is the mind map for the central bank digital currency so earlier it was subhash chandra gar committee which recommended that we need to ban the private cryptocurrencies and in its place introduce central bank digital currency so we are going to amend section 22 of the rbi act 1934 so in future currency would mean both physical currency and digital currency so i said we can go for either direct or indirect issuance of central bank digital currency you already know the central bank digital currency is a programmable money it can be used for retail transactions or the wholesale transactions in case of wholesale transactions only banks and financial institutions can use central bank digital currency normal people like you and me will not be allowed to use central bank digital currency but in case of retail central bank digital currency even we can use the central bank digital currency it is said that probably we will issue a retail central bank digital currency in future and difference between bank deposits and cbdc i have already explained and you can look at some global examples so countries such as uh, china tunisia ecuador venezuela sweden have already launched the central bank digital currency in the pilot mode it's not a full fledged currency but it's launched in a pilot mode what are the benefits of central bank digital currency first and foremost if you see presently in spite of demonetization even today the cash to gdp ratio is around 12 to 13% of our gdp so central bank digital currency will help us reduce the cash to gdp ratio it will promote financial inclusion counter private cryptocurrencies which are right now used for various illegal purposes improve cross border payments promote fintech sector such as phone pay paytm and so on then one of the biggest advantage of central bank digital currency is traceability so because of this when we introduce central bank digital currency we will be able to capture the economic activity on a real time basis this in turn will enable us to come up with the accurate gdp estimates and efficient monetary policy transmission but in spite of this there are number of challenges with respect to central bank digital currency what are these challenges now this is the most important part let's understand this coming to the first challenge there is a concept of credit intermediation what is this intermediation as far as banking sector is concerned see what the banks do banks mobilize the money from the depositors the same money they give in the form of loans so can i say banks are acting as intermediaries between savers and borrowers so this is a role of intermediation it is being said that the introduction of central bank digital currency may lead to disintermediation how let's understand that now let's say as of now we are not very sure as to central bank digital currency which is going to be unveiled whether it will be a interest bearing central bank digital currency or a non interest bearing central bank digital currency we are not very sure so let's say you keep money with the rbi in the form of central bank digital currency right now we don't know whether rbi is going to pay you the interest on such deposits or not now just imagine i'm saying just imagine let's say the central bank digital currency is a interest bearing uh, it is a interest bearing 
So you are going to get interest on the central bank digital currency, which you keep with the Reserve Bank of India. In that case, what will happen? Let's say I have money with ICICI Bank. I will withdraw this money from the ICICI Bank, put this money in the central bank digital currency with the RBI because I'm going to get interest from the RBI. So if large number of people start withdrawing the deposits from the banks and putting their deposits with the central bank digital currency, can I say the deposit base of the banks will shrink, right? The amount of deposits the banks will shrink. And as the deposits of the banks shrink, their ability to give loans will reduce. What we call this as, we call this as disintermediation. Are we clear on this? Second way of looking at it, Let's say large number of people have taken away the deposits from the banks. They have put this in the central bank digital currency, CBDC. Now banks, they would want to attract more depositors. To attract more depositors, they will start increasing the deposit rates. So deposits rates will keep increasing. Banks will be able to get deposits, but they will get deposits at a higher rate of interest. If they are getting deposits at a higher rate of interest, obviously they'll give loans at a higher rate of interest. Don't you think this will lead to decrease in credit to GDP ratio, right? So this is a problem as far as central bank digital currency is concerned. And this has been highlighted by number of financial institutions, including the IMF. Second problem is, as I said, there could be a higher burden on the RBI if you go for a direct model. So right now, the best model for India is the indirect model and not the direct model. Next is reputational risk. See, over a period of time, RBI has enjoyed huge trust, huge confidence of the people. People have trust and confidence on the Reserve Bank of India. Let's say in an unfortunate incident in future, in future, let's say an unfortunate incident of cyber warfare, cyber theft occurs on the entire ecosystem of central bank digital currency, CBDC. The trust, the confidence which RBI has earned, that will be dented. Public confidence in the RBI will be dented. So RBI may face reputational risk if the entire system of central bank digital currency comes under cyber attack or if it is not able to uh, you know, perform it efficiently. So that's the reputational risk. Next is you know, data privacy. So we will be able to trace the transactions carried out through central bank digital currency and this will violate right to privacy. And the last and uh, most important uh, problem is with respect to bank runs. Now, what is a bank run? So normally what happens is, let's say the financial status of a particular bank is deteriorating. People, even if they get a slightest hint that the financial position of bank is deteriorating, people will start withdrawing huge amount of money from the banks. So just imagine if suddenly all the depositors want to withdraw the money from the banks, this money all the time is not with the banks. Banks is given that money in the form of loans. So banks will not be able to cater to the depositor needs. So this we call it as bank run, where large number of depositors approach the bank to withdraw money and bank will not be able to cater to the demands. This is a concept of bank run. That is being said, the central bank digital currency will further accentuate the bank run. How? Now let's say you have deposited the money in a particular bank. The bank's financial position is deteriorating. You don't have confidence in the bank that the bank will repay you that money. What will happen? All the depositors of bank, even if they get a slightest hint that the financial position of bank is deteriorating, immediately they'll withdraw all of their money and try to put their money into central bank digital currency. Why? Because of much higher confidence in RBA rather than the banks. So this could facilitate the bank run. So these are the challenges as far as central bank digital currency is concerned. I hope you're clear now, all of you. So if at all you get a question in the mains examination, question could be with respect to what are the benefits and uh, what are the challenges? So if you know four to five points with respect to benefits and four to five points with respect to challenges, that should be sufficient. Now coming to surety bonds. Okay, this is interesting, little technical, but I'll try to simplify this as much as possible. Just around four to five months back, 
the insurance regulatory development authority of india came up with the guidelines for the issuance of the surety bonds by the insurance companies taking this forward in this year's budget the finance minister has announced that surety bonds would be accepted for government procurements including for the creation of infrastructure projects so what is this concept of surety bonds now before i discuss about the surety bonds let me first discuss as to how the present mechanism works and then you'll be able to correlate so we have seen as to how the road projects infrastructure projects are created in the ppp mode public private partnership what the government does government carries out an auction carries out a bidding then one particular company wins the project and that company will be required to build a road now for example let's say i own a small infrastructure company and my company here has won the bid for constructing a road in this case what happens is the government will lay down various specifications with respect to construction of the road project for example the government will say that my company should has to complete this road project in next 5 years the government will lay down the specifications as to how and in what way the road has to be constructed the government wants that i must adhere to these specifications i must complete the project on time so government ask me to give guarantee government says you give me a guarantee that you will complete the project in next 5 years within as per the specifications and if i don't complete the project i will be required to pay penalty to the government so government ask me for a guarantee to get that guarantee what i do is my infrastructure company it will approach a bank let's say icici bank and let's say the government is asking me to give a guarantee worth 1000 crores so i'll approach icici bank and say look i need to give guarantee to the government worth 1000 crores give me the guarantee but bank on its own will not give the guarantee bank will say if you want me to give a guarantee of 1000 crores you keep something as a collateral you pledge your assets so let's say my infrastructure company has a land i will pledge my land with the icici bank icici bank will give me a guarantee of 1000 crores and that guarantee i will give to the government so what happens in this case is if i don't complete the project in next 5 years or if i don't complete the project as per the specifications laid down by the government then icici bank will pay this 1000 crores to the government on my behalf are you getting this point so this is how the bank guarantee works but what are the problems with respect to bank guarantee first problem is that see my infrastructure company may be a small company since my infrastructure company is small company i may not have collateral i may not be able to pledge my assets to the banks that's the first problem that is why most of the time it's a big big infrastructure companies which win the bids for the construction of projects other problem is don't you think that in case of bank guarantees we are putting huge pressure on the banks already banks are overburdened in terms of giving loans already their balance sheet is very poor in terms of nps on top of that you are asking the bank to give guarantees so in future this could lead to an adverse impact on the balance sheet of the banks so in order to replace this bank guarantee system we have come up with the concept of the surety bonds innovative bonds now how is this surety bond going to work i hope most of you must have known the concept of health insurance right now in case of health insurance what we do let's say i want a health insurance for myself i will go to say aditya birla or reliance i'll go to this insurance companies and ask them to give me a health insurance of say rupees 5 lakh for which will i pay entire 5 lakhs no i will pay only the premium i'll pay 10000 as a premium and i will get a health insurance of 5 lakhs so in future if i get hospitalized these insurance companies will take care of my hospitalization expenses of up to rupees 5 lakhs this is how health insurance work system works surety bonds are going to work in the same way how now let's say the government is asking me 
to give a surety worth say 1000 crores so in this case what i will do is i will approach the insurance company say aditya birla or reliance and ask them to give me a surety bond worth 1000 crores but will i pay 1000 crores to these companies i will not pay the entire 1000 crores i will pay only the premium just like health insurance so here i will pay a premium of 50 crores for example i will pay a premium of 50 crores and get a surety bond of 1000 crores which i will then submit with the government so in future if i don't uh, construct the project as per the timeline as per the specifications insurance company will pay that money to the government on my behalf are we clear on this this is the concept of surety bonds how the surety bonds will benefit the indian economy you can see it will ensure timely completion of projects encourage efficient infrastructure firms and at the same time boost the insurance sector and at the same time it will reduce the dependence on the banks so this is about the surety bonds okay coming to the next digital banking units dbus recently the finance minister has announced that we will soon set up 75 digital banking units in 75 selected districts of india these digital banking units will be set up based uh, by the scheduled banks in india see when the finance minister made this announcement the finance minister has clearly not highlighted as to what are these digital banking units and how these digital banking units are going to function but broadly what we can understand is that these digital banking units will have minimal physical presence they will adopt technology to provide all the banking related services so all banking related services such as acceptance of deposits giving of loans all of this will be taken care by these digital banking units the question is why do we need digital banking units first and foremost the last to last year's economic survey had highlighted that the banking sector in case of india has remained comparatively underdeveloped that is why the credit to gdp ratio in india is lower in comparison to other countries such as us china etc so by promoting these digital banking units we will be able to develop the banking sector secondly the digital banking units use technology to provide various services so unlike the conventional branches of the banks the digital banking units will be much more efficient and because of their efficiency higher efficiency they will be able to earn more profits more profits means better growth of the banking sector and lastly we have seen that in the recent years a number of uh, uh, the digital payments have increased because of upi bmap and so on so the next logical step is to go for digital banking units now this topic becomes important because of recent recommendation of niti aayog with respect to digital banks in india see at the global level we have seen the rapid growth of what is known as challenger banks or neo banks the challenger banks are or the neo banks are banks which are considered to be 100% digital they do not have physical branches they are 100% digital banks and these banks are called as challenger banks because they are able to challenge the conventional brick and mortar bank, uh, banks for example in uk you have two banks that is starling bank and uh, monis bank which are called as the challenger bank because they are able to challenge already well established banks in uk as far as india is concerned in case of india there is no provision for issuing licenses to 100% digital banks if a bank wants to provide digital banking services it can very well do so but it should first have physical branches without having physical branches it cannot just provide only the digital banks banking services so niti aayog had recommended that probably in future rbi may think of issuing licenses to 100% digital banks so what i feel is as far as this year's budget announcement is concerned 
this is going to be a pilot initiative. We are not issued licenses for 100% digital banks. Rather, we have asked the scheduled banks to open digital banking units. So this is a pilot initiative. So we'll learn from this experience. We'll understand the challenges. We'll understand the successes of this model. Based upon that, in future, probably we will go for the issuance of 100% digital banking licenses. So this is the digital banking. Next is blended financing for the sunrise sectors. Okay. So here, as part of this topic is concerned, you must understand what is alternate investment funds, what are fund of funds and the concept of blended finance. So I will probably uh, some, uh, complete the discussion in the next uh, 10 minutes. So bear with me for another 10 more minutes. So we'll be done with the discussion. So let's discuss about this, about the sunrise sectors, starting with the alternate investment funds. So what are alternate investment funds? AIFs. Alternate investment funds are considered to be the pooled investment vehicles because they're pooling money from different categories of investors, that is both domestic investors and foreign investors. And the money so pooled is in turn invested in different sectors such as infrastructure, real estate, startup companies or MSMEs. These alternate investment funds, they are registered as trust or a company and they are regulated by capital market regulator SEBI. Now, is the video off? Are you able to see now? Yes. Okay. So here the alternate investment funds, they make investment in different sectors. Now, for example, uh, let's say the money has been pulled from different uh, categories of investors and this money, let's say they give in the form of loans to the infrastructure projects. So whatever interest is earned on these uh, loans, that interest is in turn distributed among various categories of investors. Now, some of you must be feeling that alternate investment funds are similar to mutual funds, right? So even in mutual funds also, money is pulled in from different investors and money is in turn invested in shares, bonds, debentures. But please understand, alternate investment funds are not mutual funds. They are specific categories of funds. Because these investors who are making investment, they are actually most of the time high net worth individuals, people who are extremely rich. Those are people who normally make investment in alternate investment funds. So they mobilize money and the money is invested in different uh, sectors. So if you look at SEBI guidelines on alternate investment fund, we have basically three categories of alternate investment fund. First category is that category of alternate investment fund, which makes investment in early stage projects, which are considered to be socially and economically desirable. For example, you must have heard about venture capital fund. Venture capital fund makes investment in startup companies, right? Then you have SME fund, infrastructure fund. So this is category one. Category two alternate investment funds are those funds which uh, are not investing in early stage projects, but rather they're helping in meeting the operational requirements of already existing projects. Now, let's say there's an infrastructure company, which is already well established. And this infrastructure company needs money to undertake financing for infrastructure. To such infrastructure companies, the alternate investment fund will give the loans. For example, you have the debt fund. Similarly, you have the real estate fund. Third category, it is considered to be more risky, but uh, high return activity. So basically high net worth individuals, they pull in their money and that money is in turn invested in stock markets across the world. So they invest in different, different instruments, such as say, you know, shares, bonds, futures, options, currency derivatives, and so on. It is considered to be very high risk and it is placed under the third category. And they're also referred to as hedge funds. 
So this is what you must know as far as the alternate investment fund is concerned. Now, what is fund of fund then? Fund of fund is a fund which in turn makes investment in other alternate investment funds. So you can see this fund of fund, it is making investment in other alternate investment funds. So this fund of fund will call them as father fund and this alternate investment fund, we call them as daughter fund. Let me give an example here to substantiate this. For example, you have the fund of fund for the startups. This fund of fund for the startups is presently managed by SIDBI. So what happens is this father fund that is fund of funds of SIDBI, it will in turn make investment in other alternate investment funds, which give financing to the startup companies. So please have a look at this. When financing is given to the startup companies, can I say money is coming from the government and money is coming from the private sector also? Yes. Money is coming from the government and government uh, money is coming from the private sector. And that is why we call this as blended finance. Are we clear on this? So similar to this fund of fund for the startups, you have electronics development fund. Then in the recent Atma Nirbha Bharat package, we had launched fund of fund for the S, uh, MSMEs. In this year's budget, the finance minister has announced that soon we will have fund of funds for certain sunrise sectors of the economy. Example being agri tech, digital economy, pharma, climate action, deep technology, such as artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, big data, so on. So just like how you have fund of fund for startups, right? We will have fund of fund for agri tech, fund of fund for pharma, fund of fund for climate action. So government will provide the funding to uh, invest money in alternate investment funds and money will also be pulled in from other private investors. So that is why we call it as blended financing. Are we clear? Okay. Next is soaring gold bonds. So what are soaring gold bonds? See, whenever the government wants to borrow money from the market, the government issues dated bonds. These dated bonds have a face value, a rate of interest and a maturity period. Similar to these dated bonds. Now the government of India is going to issue soaring gold bonds. Sorry, soaring green bonds. As the name suggests, this soaring green bonds will be exclusively used for financing green energy projects, renewable energy projects such as solar energy, wind energy, uh, and so on. So if you look at the brief background about the green bonds, if you see already the first ever green bond in the world was issued in Europe. And the first ever green bond, which was issued in Europe was named as climate awareness bond. So India is not the first country to issue the soaring green bond. Similarly, world bank has also issued the green bonds. Then we have this international organization known as climate bonds initiative. It's an international organization, which provides hand holding support to the countries for the issuance of green bonds. It provides various kinds of advisory services to the countries. So please remember this about uh, climate bonds initiative uh, from the perspective of prelims. As far as developments in India is concerned, in the year 2016, SEBI had already come up with the guidelines for the issuance of green bonds. Subsequent to which IRFC, a public sector company known as Indian Railway Finance Corporation had issued the green bonds for the electrification of railways. Even private company that is Adani Energy has also issued the green bonds. So far, so far the issuance of green bonds was limited to public sector companies and private companies. Now government on its own is going to issue the green bonds. That's the news. I hope you're getting this point. So what we are going to call them as soaring green bonds. Apart from that, I hope most of you must have heard about uh, recapitalization bonds. Recapitalization bonds are issued by the government to undertake recapitalization of public sector banks. Whatever money the government raises 
through recapitalization bonds is it accounted under the fiscal deficit it is not accounted under fiscal deficit as of now but now whatever money the government is going to uh, raise through the soaring green bonds that money the government will account it as part of the fiscal deficit please remember this from the perspective of prelims examination it will be added up to the government's borrowing that is fiscal deficit last uh, initiative okay last this is the last slide so one we have anywhere uh, any time anywhere post office savings so right now the department of post is implementing a it modernization project known as core banking solution as part of core banking solution all the 1.5 lakh post offices that we have in india they will be linked to each other so we are going to network all the 1.5 lakh post offices once we network all of these 1.5 lakh post offices people who have accounts with the post office they will have number of benefits for example once these uh, post offices are, are integrated i need not visit my post office branch i can visit any other post offices across india so let's say if i have a post office account with mumbai there is no need for me to approach only that post office branch i can do the transaction through a post office branch even in delhi also why because these two post office will get interlinked apart from that just like how you do transactions with the banks through internet banking mobile banking withdrawal of money from atms similar to that if people are having an account with the post offices savings account they will do inter, they will be able to do internet banking mobile banking and withdraw money from the atms and third benefit is you can have a integration between your bank account and the post office account so you can transfer money from your bank account to post office account and from post office account to your bank account so this the government says is any time anywhere post office savings and the last and uh, important initiative is with respect to expert panel for private equity and venture capital investment so when you look at private equity private equity is a investment which is made in the unlisted firms so when you look at companies in india companies can be distinguished as listed companies and unlisted companies listed companies are those which are listed on bsc nsc unlisted companies are not so listed so when people are making investment in these unlisted companies we call them it as private equity a form of private equity is a venture capital when investment is made in the startup companies so there is not much of a difference between private equity and venture capital except the fact that venture capital is a form of private equity where investment is made in the startup companies last financial year it was a boom for the startups in india because we were able to attract huge amount of investment into these startup companies so a large number of unicorns were born in india in the last financial year because these startup companies were able to get a lot of private equity and venture capital but the government believes that still there is a huge scope to attract uh, private equity and venture capital into startup companies for example right now there is a huge compliance burden on the private equity and venture capital for example different government agencies different government departments have put in their own rules and regulations we have rules and regulations made by sebi rules and regulations made by rbi rules and regulations made by department of economic affairs so when there are multiple rules it creates confusion it increases the compliance burden and reduces the private equity and venture capital apart from that it has been said that 80% of the funding that we got last year was basically from foreign investors so most of the private equity or venture capital is from foreign investors only remaining 15 to 20% is coming from domestic investors 
so we are unable to tap in to the domestic investors for private equity and venture capital that is why the government said that we'll soon set up a expert panel to look into all the issues related to the private equity and venture capital so as soon as this particular committee submits its recommendations these recommendations will be accepted so this is about the expert panel for private equity and venture capital so when we started our discussion right okay when we started our discussion i told you that we will be discussing the entire budget in terms of different themes so we have covered the two most important themes of this year's budget that is infrastructure and banking and finance and the kind of analysis which we are doing in the union budget uh, that is the analysis of the budget it's very difficult for me to cover the entire budget in just one session right even if i cover the, i can very well do that i can cover the budget in just uh, one and a half to two hours but i feel that i'll not be able to do justice to the students which which i would not prefer to do that so that is why as far as this class is concerned i have covered almost say 60% of the budget then in the next class that we will be having in the next week same sunday 11 uh, am in the next class the other important themes that is agriculture industry public finance then inclusive growth these topics will be covered i hope you are clear now all of you okay apart from that uh, see whatever session which we had had so far with respect to uh, budget discussion the same way we also conduct current affairs classes as part of the gsi qip program so the details of the gsi qip program it will be shared with you in the chat box so you can go to the gsi qip program details so as you can see it will have current affairs classes integrated test series and for prelims and mains qip prelims and mains plus the mentorship so you can go through the gsi qip program details to know more about it so in the way we have covered the budget the same way we do it in the gsi qip program fine then you can start asking me your doubts so in case if you have your doubts please uh, feel free to ask your doubts do not uh, uh, hold on to your doubts because it will create more confusion so do not hesitate to ask doubts to me 